Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have David Cadavy with us. David, thanks for being on the show. Hey there, thanks a lot for having me, Bronson. Yeah, we're really excited to have you here. Um, now, David, you're a designer and an author that is trying to serve the startup community, uh, or more specifically, the hacker community. So tell us about your new book. Uh, what's it called? What's it about? Give us the inside scoop on it. Well, my book is called Design for Hackers. Uh, I actually have a, a copy right here. Um, I take notes in my own book. Um, <laughs> That's how much you like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's called Design for Hackers. Uh, the tagline is Design for Hackers Reverse Engineering Beauty. And this is a, a book, uh, as the name implies, that is to teach hackers uh, about design. Uh, now, it's not so much like a, a quick top 10 tips to make great design. Um, I don't know if such a thing could actually exist. Mm -hmm. um, but as a reverse engineering beauty, part of it would imply it's more of providing a framework to understand design. So uh, I use examples like impressionist painting and Renaissance sculpture and things like that to talk about design principles. Yeah, that's great. Now, do you have a background in designing for startups? Because it seems like you would if you decided to write a book like this. Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, I, I got my degree in graphic design. I've been obsessed with design since I could hold a pencil. I was doing calligraphy when I was in like fourth grade and stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, then I, I, I worked for uh, headed uh, departments of a couple startups in, in the Valley starting around 2005 or so and then um, have uh, then started doing um, freelance work for various startups uh, around the Valley as well. Yeah, so. and it seems like you've been involved with a few startups that we'd probably recognize the name of. What are a couple of the ones that you were with? <laughs> uh, well, I guess some of the clients that I've had that you would probably recognize the names of, I guess, would be uh, PB, PB Wiki, which yeah. is now PB Works, mm -hmm. um, and User Voice. Yeah, that and, was the one I remember reading about. Yeah, and then one that I did a lot of work for was Odesk. Not, not yeah. as a contractor on Odesk as I was working, uh, doing work for Yeah, Odesk. you weren't just another guy on Odesk trying to get a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not always. <laughs> yeah, you were helping Odesk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let me ask you kind of the, the most important question, I think, to begin the whole interview, right? Which is, do you believe that user adoption is related to good design? Uh, and what I mean is, do better design products actually have a better chance in the marketplace? Because if the answer is no, then I don't know why you're on this program. So I want to I know. I know. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I, would, I mean, obviously, I, obviously, uh, th I think that it makes a, a big difference. But um, you know, it's not necessarily just what I think. This is this is uh, I think been been proven uh, not just through anecdotes by you know people use Apple as an example all the time. Um, but but uh, there was a study by uh, a researcher at Stanford, B.J. Fogg. He's he's really well known for his his studying of persuasion and stuff, and he did this this study where he sat down people in front of websites and collected their comments on, you know, do you find this, think that this is a, a credible website? And a huge amount, 46% of all the comments people made were about the design. So they would say things about the fonts or it looks more professional, mm -hmm. it just looks more credible, or, or that it's sloppy and it looks unprofessional. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's uh, in a, an objective example um, yeah. Of, yeah. of design being really influential. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's, it's, it's a great way that if you have a, a good design, you just instantly add value mm -hmm. uh, in the mind of, of the user. I mean, you, you, this is a new program, Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I gotta tell you, like, uh, I, I'm a little biased, but, but, you know, I, when you asked me to be on this program, mm -hmm. I went to check out your website. I'm like, oh, well, the di design looks pretty good. So mm -hmm. they, they must know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'll so take that as a personal yeah. compliment since I'm the designer with everything here. So. Oh, great. Well, good job. <laughs> <laughs> I have the guy writing a book on design saying my designs aren't too bad. That's a good thing. Yeah. It was, it was good enough to get me to you know, sit down and, and chat for a while. So. Exactly. And maybe after the interview's over, I can have you critique it a little more and tell me what you really yeah, think. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, I know you do design critiques for startups as well. Um, yeah, something to do. So, so that was interesting. With that study with uh, Fogg, he asked him about credibility. He didn't say, what do you think about the design? He says, do you think it's credible? And they answered with design. So that's how we know that the link is in their mind, not in leading the witness kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's an academic study, peer-reviewed mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. Um, and I, I was just actually just reviewing that study a little bit earlier today for something else that I was I was working on, and uh, they he, they were actually uh, if you if you read the paper, uh, the, they actually were were sort of surprised that wasn't mm -hmm. what they expected yeah. uh, for, for the comments to be like that. And additionally, I think 
um, another, uh, I don't think these, these are mutually exclusive, but like another 25% or so of the comments were about uh, organization, visual organization, information yeah. architecture stuff. Which, which could yeah. be under design. I mean, it's, it's just super yeah. important as well. Depending on how you define design, it could be a part of it there. Um, yeah, it's a huge amount. Absolutely. Well, I mean, if design is a part of the growth equation, and if, it, if, if design leads to credibility, then I think it is a part of the growth equation. I think better design products have a better chance to grow because people see them as credible. Then it's going to be really important that our audience understand how to hack design in order to aid their growth. And that's really why I have you here, right? I want yeah, you to give us right. kind of, you know, the, 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 the quick kind of snapshot. Here's the basics. Obviously, they need to go buy your book. They need to read it. They really need to <laughs> have the framework um, because, like you said, there is no here's the top ten. But I try yeah. to distill your book down into some questions for you to really uh, help our community out here. Um, so let's start really broad, all right? Uh, what are your cool. thoughts on design trends? You know, for instance, uh, you know, this was more popular a couple years ago, but we talk about the web 2.0 style, you know, and things like that. Is it good if we jump into a design trend that's popular? Or do you think startups should just do their own thing, do what seems right to them, chart their own path, and ignore convention? What, what do you think the best way to grow a startup is from a design point of view? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to give you the the sort of ideal world scenario. Of course, we're we're all building startups and bootstrapping. Resources are going to be tight mm -hmm. in times. But in 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 a, a perfect scenario, you're going to uh, really think about your problems and, and uh, that you're that you're trying to solve and approach the the design from that standpoint. So you got to be careful with with trends. I think um, you know Web 2.0 is one that you mentioned. Uh, Right now, there's this big flat design trend going on, which is basically um, saying, oh, buttons shouldn't look like buttons. They should be flat color. Uh, and that's a reaction sort mm -hmm. of to, to Web, web 2.0. But if you think of it, and, and a part of uh, what flat design depends upon is that your user doesn't need that much affordance, right? They don't need to know mm -hmm. that this is a button. So it doesn't have to look like a button, right? Mm -hmm. Um, now, if you're designing an app that is going to be used by or is predominantly for, say, seniors, mm -hmm. or uh, like you, you can't just put a, a, a square there and expect them to know that that's a button. So you're going to have to think a lot about your users. So I, yeah, I definitely think that uh, in an ideal scenario, you're not going to approach it from the standpoint of design trends. You're going to think about the technology and the, the audience. And, and go from there. Yeah, and then if your audience and the technology leads you to a certain trend, then you're not necessarily against it. It's just that you need to start with who's the audience, what's the technology, or the platforms, and then you start from there and you see where it takes you. Exactly. I mean, that's where trends come from. Trends come from technology. You know, they come from a real place. <laughs> like they come from. <laughs> Oh, you know, with Web 2.0, it was like, oh, wow, we can, we have the bandwidth now. We've got the colors in the screens to do this. Mm -hmm. And it was inspired by, by the Mac OS X Aqua interface and stuff, which was just like, that was bleeding edge mm -hmm. technology at the time. And so that's where the trend comes from. But then it's when, when people start copying the visual yeah. look of something rather than where it really comes from, that's where uh, there starts to be some incong incongruency um, in, in the design. And, and that's... Uh, it isn't always a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And see, that's a great point even about growth because if you just imitate or copy a design because it helps them grow, but you have a different audience with oh, different yeah. goals, now you have a similar looking design and yet you're not growing and they are because you ripped something off instead of understanding it at a deep level. Do you think that's fair enough? Yeah, I think totally. I mean, just imagine um, uh, imagine if you if you uh, wanted to hire a lawyer, lawyer and you went to their website and it just had like glossy, yeah. <laughs> you know, glossy reflections and and uh, and and glossy buttons and, mm -hmm. and stuff too. It, it's got to be appropriate for the audience. Just to reference that that fog study ag again too. You know, just because your design looks good. Uh, you know, it has to be appropriate for what it is. There were there are also people who had negative comments for you know this looks like a marketing team built this. You know, this like doesn't it was too slick or something. It was too slick for whatever uh, whatever the uh, um, whatever the site was really about or whatever yeah. the audience was. Yeah, now I think that's a great insight because you know in this program we're trying to help people grow 
and design's a piece of that. And so I think that's why your book is important because it gives you a framework for understanding design, not a, hey, let's go rip off everything that's beautiful because that may not help you grow. Um, yeah. Now let me get to uh, a presentation you gave at South by Southwest. Um, I-, I think I have this stat right. I might have misquoted you here. I'm not 100% sure. But you talked about the importance of typography and you said it was something like, 70 or 80 percent of web design is typography is that right <laughs> well i mean first of all made up made up stat well, of right? course yeah, yeah. i'm not holding you to it or anything <laughs> yeah 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 so whether you got it wrong or not is it necessarily as important as the fact that yeah typography is is really important this is you know the information is the life but lifeblood of of the web and the way that we convey information is, is through typography um so yeah it's a it's a it's a huge part yeah. So, so help the startups watching this. What should they know about typography? It seems like you're kind of obsessed with typography. As I look at the book, it has almost an inordinate yeah. amount of space because it's like you just know a lot about it. You care about it a lot. In your presentations, yeah. I mean, you're talking about look what the ascender does and look how it makes you feel and you know, all this stuff. Yeah. So you you seem to be the person to go to on typography. Um, tell yeah. us what we need to know about it. Yeah, definitely guilty as charged. Yeah. I've been obsessed with typography for a long time, and then that, and that's that's because of of the things I've said that you know it's such an important part of how we convey information and, and the the technology behind it, and it's such a a, a fascinating thing behind design is typography. Um, now, as far as what startups should know about typography, is is uh, you know if, if you're looking to 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 make Good design quickly and and to to make good use of your time, uh, it almost helps you to know uh, in, in some ways a little bit less about typography. I think that a, a mistake that I see happen a lot of times is, is people get font anxiety. They <laughs> yeah, like they, they, there's so many fonts out there. There's thousands and thousands of fonts out there. It doesn't help that the Google Font Library has <laughs> over 600 typefaces on it now. Yeah, um, and you know the majority of Typefaces, the majority of fonts that are out there are are um, are not very good. Yeah, you can you, say really. It. <laughs> you, you don't need you don't need all of them. Uh-huh. Um, so I think that that kind of identifying a few good go to typefaces and worrying about other things because it's it's the other things, the things you can't see in design that really make the difference, that really make people say, "Oh, this looks clean. This looks credible." It's the mm-hmm. things like. Spacing and and sizing and and white space and alignment those are the things mm-hmm. that you can spend much more time worrying about than than say what font you have and and just uh, if people are looking for a resource on, on that I actually have a a PDF of of like uh, all the fonts you'll ever need is what it's called and it's associated with that South by Southwest talk yeah. and people can get that at designforhackers.com yeah. Um, yeah. And that's no, in, my, I, in the book as well. I recommend them uh, getting that. Um, and you only list like how many is like twenty fonts or something, or how many fonts I, are I don't in know. it? It's 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 fewer than that. And and yeah. you know people sometimes take that all the fonts you ever need thing uh, really literally. The the point of <laughs> of it is is like if you were to just use those fonts, mm-hmm. um, you could still do really great work. Yeah. yeah, you would have plenty of other things to worry about. I mean, the, the early typographers. Had to carve out all these little letters <laughs> just to make a font, uh-huh. and 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 now we can just pick from our list of thousands, mm-hmm. and 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 you can do gr- great work with with simple choices. Is, yeah. is the point it's of it funny all. as a designer, you know, I have access to my fonts and you know thousands upon thousands yeah. of fonts, and I find myself going back to the tried and the true ones that just look great every time. You know, it's hard for me to get away from Din. You know, it's hard for yeah. me to get away from just my go-to fonts. You know. Yes, same same way for me. I mean, it's it the the amount of great typography that's coming out. There, it's really staggering how much how many good typefaces really do come out. But there's also a lot. Yeah, it it, it just can get really confusing. Yeah, no, um, that, that's great advice. Um, in your book, you also have a, a section on uh, composition and proportions. Yeah. So I want you to walk us through those a little bit because I think that's really <laughs> helpful as like kind of the framework idea again. Uh, what is sure. composition? What is proportions? And more so, how do they affect the end user? Because that's what we're really talking about here, growing, the end user adopting our yeah. products. How do proportions and composition really play into that end user experience? Yeah, uh, so a composition, I, I think like pretty much 
everything is is a composition. So people who are looking at this screen, you know, it's composed a certain way. Like here I am over here. There's some stuff in the background. If you're watching a movie, every frame is composed a certain way. So like maybe a, a character is in the in the foreground and and that's that's what you're supposed to see at that moment. Mm-hmm. And so what a composition does is help arrange things um, almost in, in levels of importance. And so if if you were thinking about your site as a composition, as something that somebody can look at in a split second and and they're going to see certain things before they see other things, mm-hmm. um, that that is going to be very important to meeting your goals as a startup, meeting your marketing goals, um, because hopefully you have figured out when somebody visits your site or starts using your app, there's something some things that you want them to do more than you want them to do other things. Yeah. And, and so understanding sort of the 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 meta composition of something in relationship to your goals is is uh, is really important for startups i think absolutely now what is proportions how what, what, where do we go with that <laughs> yeah so proportion is is just you know, the proportional relationship be, between uh things so like this book has a proportion to it you know it's a certain width and then that is a certain uh it has a, a certain height, and, and there's a proportional relationship to those, to those things. And um, if you are, if you use, use proportions wisely, uh, you can start to create like a more cohesive relationship between all the different things that are on your page. Like whether uh-huh. you're using font size, or you know, people use the the grid a lot, and that allows them to. Um, create proportions like maybe maybe they have a, a main area that's three columns and then a side area that's one column, mm-hmm. and, and being consistent with those proportions uh, also helps create consistency and cohesiveness, and it also makes it easier to make decisions. Yeah, yeah. In your book, I think you uh, use the example of Think Vitamin. Is that the screenshot you have in the book at one spot? Yeah, yeah, one's yeah. In there. And I like that example because when I go to it, the proportion and the composition is just so clear and obvious and almost comforting. It's like I look at their blog post titles and the titles of the blog posts are just huge. I mean, I don't know what the type point is, but it's just this huge (laughs) title. And then, you know, below it is smaller. So it's like you get structure instantly. Like, oh, these are the titles. This is what's below it. And then on the right side, you have these huge social media icons. So it's like, you know where their eyes want you to go. Look at our blog titles. Look at our social media links. Like you can see their call to actions and how they composed it and how they proportioned it. And it feels right. Like, when I go to a site that is not, the proportions are off, maybe I don't know why, but I know they are. Like, I feel weird even if I can't put my finger on it, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's the thing is that uh, uh, all, all those things that you're mentioning, the titles, the on social media icons, those are just all little things that a lot of people, they, they just they sort of look at them as details, but you step back and look at the composition of everything. Mm-hmm. You know, what is more important than the, than the next thing? That's where you start to understand if you're if 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 the the design and layout that you have is, is likely to meet your your goals and stuff and and that's a problem that a lot of people run into is that they're 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 too concerned about the things that they can see mm-hmm. like the little details mm-hmm. than than they are about all these these alignment relationships and things like that yeah that's great and you know sometimes it's funny I'll show designs to my wife just to get her opinion and she'll feel awkward about something even if she knows nothing about design if I haven't designed it well, <laughs> you know? And right. so it's like, I don't take her input like as a designer, as a fellow designer giving me input. I take it as a, hey, you don't know anything about design. How does this make you feel, <laughs> you know? And, and I take exactly. it with that kind of, you know, filter in place, like knowing she may say some things that don't matter, but there may be other things that I really need to listen to because as a whole, there's a composition going on here that's greater than, oh, why'd you use that font? Because she doesn't care about fonts, you know? Yeah. What's the first thing you notice? I mean, sometimes... That really surprises you, mm-hmm. what what you hear somebody say that they notice. Yeah, her eyes uh, will be drawn to something. That's like, what? Well, that's not my call to action. That's not even on the radar of call to actions. Like, yeah. it, it kind of sucks that her eyes are being drawn to that. I got to figure out something, you know. Oh, good thing you figured it out, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, no, that's great, great advice. Yeah. Um, now, in your book, you also have a section called design principles, and I really like this just because if there are kind of any just 
quick takeaways, I feel like these are the ones. Like, <laughs> if there if there was it in a nutshell, make sure you remember these. It feels like this is what they sure. are. Um, I want you to talk us through these a little bit because you said that these are what make a composition really attractive. These kind of principles, these design principles, um, and they're also simple to understand. That's why I like them. I think they're super important. They're easy takeaways, and they're not super complicated to really get our head around. So I'm going to have you walk through each one of them for just a, a moment here. Um, let's start with dominance. Uh, I think that's the first one in the book. Uh, what is dominance in web design? Pretty simple. Um, you know, if 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 one thing is like bigger, more visually dominant than another thing, mm -hmm. then it's going to be clear to you that you should be looking at that yeah. thing before the other thing, and that's um, sort of creates some interest in in a composition. But it also uh, helps you meet your 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 goals for what you're doing if if you can get people. To, people's attention on the things that you want them to be paying attention to. Yeah, and that's where sometimes you almost have to, uh, you have to think like a marketer sometimes and think like a designer sometimes, but it's like when yeah. you put on the marketer hat, like make the thing bigger that you want them to pay attention to. As a designer, it seems like I'm always wanting to bring things more subdued. I want to get more to like where things don't stand out as much. I'm trying to paint yeah. the Mona Lisa instead of having a call to action, you know? And so yeah, well, it's... Yeah. By all means, make the thing that you want people to pay attention to bigger. Mm -hmm. But when you make all the things bigger, yeah, then you got a problem because then you don't have dominance anymore. Exactly. You know, if you highlight to... every line in a book, you've highlighted nothing. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, make something <laughs> dominant. You know, um, and don't be afraid to have a call to action because it's people are drawn to them. They do click on the things you want them to click on if you create it properly. Um, so that's kind of the first design principle. Um, the next one is similarity. Uh, what does that one mean? What is that? Uh, similarity is 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 that uh, as it sounds again um, when when things are similar that you're gonna that you're gonna connect them to each mm -hmm. other um, so you might have a, a, um, some icons that all belong to the same to the to the same application mm -hmm. and there might be some similarities in the way that um, things are expressed like maybe maybe one thing is a telephone. And another thing is is a question mark or something, but something about the way that the lines um, express mm -hmm. what the forms are helps connect them together. Yeah, um, and that's, that that can help create cohesiveness. Yeah, you know, one thing I see a lot sometimes online, I'll be browsing around and I'll see somebody use an illustration at one point and then they use a photo at another point and I'm just like, oh, mm -hmm. why are you mixing photos and illustrations? It's like the yeah. worst example of something being dissimilar, you know? Um, that's kind of the other end of the spectrum, right? Right, yeah. If, if, if you want to have a lot of visual consistency, um, then taking things to the next level where, where yeah, using all illustration mm -hmm. versus... All photos and having the same style, whether it's mm -hmm. the same style of photography or the same mm -hmm. style of illustration, um, helps yeah create that cohesiveness, create the sense that you're in this same world or this of this brand of this yeah. this company or whatever that you've created. You know, you talked earlier about the the confidence or uh, uh, in the fog study, right? You know that they felt it was credible. Right. I feel yeah. like similarity is one of those things that just give a lot of credibility. Like dominance, maybe, maybe not. I don't know if having a dominant call to action makes somebody feel like it's sure. credible. But similarity, I get, I get that feeling. Like if I can see that there's a lot of components on the page and that the same mind really thought through each of those components and how they fit together, I'm like, all yeah. right, like you have credibility now in mind. Somebody took the requisite time to make this make sense all over yeah. the place, <laughs> you know? It kind of reminds me. I was just on. A, I was. I was making. I was booking a flight on an airline the other day, and I, I went to their homepage, and it was like, "Oh, cool! They've like redesigned it. Like it looks so much better and stuff." And then I started booking my flight, mm -hmm. and then I got into deeper into the site, and I was like, "Oh, it's the same <laughs> crappy site that it was before." And it wasn't. It was uh -huh. just, um, so I was a little disappointed because of that, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> still booked the flight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no choice, right? <laughs> yeah. So we have dominance. We have similarity. Uh, talk to us about rhythm. Rhythm, yeah. yeah. Rhythm, see, a lot of these things are intertwined in a way. Yeah. So rhythm uh, is it, it's sort of a, a repetition or, or similarity of things that um, can help draw someone's eye throughout mm -hmm. things. People talk a lot about trying to create vertical rhythm with with typography, with each line of type. Um, people, A lot of people are really into the vertical grid. Um, so, so that's rhythm. Uh, it can be... Uh, even these space units of of things, or it can just be that there's some sort of similarity, and it helps uh, draw someone's 
someone's eye throughout yeah. the composition or along to something. Yeah. You yeah. can almost say that all these other principles lead to rhythm when they're done well. If you do everything else the way you need to, the rhythm is there. You're just kind of on beat moving through the site, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're so connected, you know, and I remember even being in design school and kind mm -hmm. of and learning about these different principles and being like, oh, man, come on, like, <laughs> who made up this stuff? Yeah, but right. uh, when, when, if you really take the time to, to, to practice them and observe them and get to, get to know them, then it starts to make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, the next one, the fourth one is texture. Uh, talk, us about, talk to us about texture for a second. Yeah, so texture is in some ways can be uh, intertwined with, with rhythm and that if you have rep repeating elements, you're mm -hmm. going to create sort of a, a texture. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 texture can, can signify differences, it can create interest. When you think about even uh, if, if you're going to get up in the morning and have yogurt and granola with strawberries, you know, mm -hmm. it's like different textures. It's a lot more interesting mm -hmm. to, to eat that. W whatever you're designing can be a lot like that. It can create interest. It can also, you can also use texture to, uh, to create relationships that say, you know, this is, this is different information from this. This is more important. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, we made this with like paper or stone and we made this button glossy, <laughs> which isn't, it isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. Um, but, it can also apply to typography. So every typeface, when you put it in a block of text, line after line after line, that creates a certain sort of texture mm -hmm. to it. And so as you're using bold typefaces or light, that those are creating different textures. And, and, mm -hmm. and sort of if you step back and squint your eyes and, and look at how these different pieces of type, mm -hmm. uh, how those textures are expressed, then you, then you, you can start to see... Um, more ways of 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 achieving that uh, those relationships between that information. This is more important than that is, or this is just different than that is, even yeah. though they're both similarly important. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, let me ask you about a direction. Um, or, or the fifth one here. What is direction in web design? Direction again, exactly as it sounds. Uh, the the <laughs> idea of, of of directing uh, someone's eye mm -hmm. uh, from one part of the composition, mm -hmm. from part of your site to another part. It could be that you have that dominant element that you really want them to see. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's some things that sort of support that. And so maybe you're lining things up mm -hmm. or, you know, sometimes people just go ahead and use an arrow, but there's a lot of different, <laughs> different ways you can do that. You can, you, you can create direction. Right, and the, uh, the last one is contrast. Uh, what is contrast? Contrast can come in, in, in so many different forms. It can be dark, light, big, small, uh, it, 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 it's simply, or, or a, a, a rough texture and a smooth texture, as I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. So contrast is just making sure that uh, for the sake of visual interest or, or if you're, uh, you, you can use it to uh, create information hierarchies, mm -hmm. um, that something is visually way different from mm -hmm. another thing, really. No, it makes These sense. are different things that, that make, uh, that kind of get to, to make designs interesting and engaging. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it seems like if a, if a hacker was going to sit down and try to design something, if they just paid really close attention to these six, they might be able to pull off a decent design. <laughs> you know? If they gave yeah, something possibly. dominance, they had similar elements, they had a rhythm to their design, there was texture to it, and everything wasn't blending together the same exact thing. There was a direction to the design, the information, there was contrast, so something stood out, others blended in. Like, it'd be hard to make it too bad, <laughs> right? Yeah, the, the trick is, is uh, the trick a lot of the time is, is really thinking about what it is that you want to say and what are your goals important thing over the other thing. And, and sometimes it's not so much of a problem of, of having the design skill as it is of, of having the clear vision of what it is that, that you want to say. I mean, a lot of times you work with somebody, uh, a lot of times business problems within the company mm -hmm. manifest themselves in, in, in poor design because mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you don't know what you're doing as a company, it makes it hard, it makes it impossible yeah. uh, to make to, to know what you're doing with design. Or if you have different little groups within the company becoming warring factions, each wanting the website to represent their needs, all of a sudden you have a website that represents nobody needs, you know? I, I feel like you've, you've, been, you've uh, <laughs> somehow seen 
a section of my life. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just I'm also a designer. We all have the same sad story <laughs> okay. to tell. <laughs> um, now, let's talk about color for a second. Um, color can be maybe one of the trickiest things. It's still hard for me to this day to get the right colors. Uh, is there any shortcuts? I know that's not the right question to ask. I know that we're supposed to say, well, no, it's a, it's, there's a high-level theory here. Don't try to make a shortcut. But are there any shortcuts that we can kind of take away when it comes to selecting colors? First of all, you're absolutely right. Color's hard. Um, I, I think if there... Uh, for something together quickly, it would be um, think about that, that goes well and sort of mix that up with with uh, levels of grays a little bit. Uh, then then that can add dimension too. It helps to learn about the different color schemes mm -hmm. that are available. Uh, the the can all this is to watch out sort of for color conventions you know if you're if you're using red um, sometimes if you're using that in the wrong context it can make it like something's broken or there's a warning or something like that so mm -hmm. you know so, so some colors do have um, sort of conventional meanings in certain contexts so that's something to watch out for too yeah absolutely thank you for that um, now lastly I got a few questions for you to kind of give back to the community here um, and, and they're less about your book and more about uh, what you've seen in your life and what you can recommend to us. Now, you're a sure. mentor at 500 Startups. Yeah. Um, my guess is that you're mentoring them on design decisions. Uh, would that be accurate? <laughs> you know, that would, that would be uh, accurate. But like, as I said, a lot of the time, uh, the, conversation, cause I, the conversation always starts with, you know, tell me about your company. Yeah. What are you trying to do? Um, and... And a lot of times, the, sometimes the, the, the conversation doesn't even get to design because <laughs> there's so much to be figured out before you can get that design right. But yeah. yes, in, 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 in the perfect scenario, yeah, I, That's I what do. you would be doing, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Because design can only be right or wrong based on who they are and what they're trying to do. Design they, can't be right if you don't know what they're trying to do because then you're just judging based on what you aesthetically think is pleasing, not what's on effective or needed at all. <laughs> Yeah, you can't just like slap a, a a pretty design on a on a, a concept that mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Design doesn't work that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you this: What design mistakes do you see startups making just kind of over and over? What are the things that you just want to like have written out on a cue card and just hand them? Like, look, I don't feel like telling you this. I've already said it three times a day. Here's the index card with notes on it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they actually have have even created a presentation uh, based on on this that I give, give sometimes. I didn't know and, that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called design pitfalls or whatever. Okay. Well, then I uh, asked the perfect question to you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one is is the font anxiety that I talked about, mm -hmm. worrying about all the, the fonts that are out there. Um, another big thing is competing elements. I think uh, a lot of times it, people are putting too, di too many different things on, on their design mm -hmm. and it's not clear what is the number one thing I should be looking at right now. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, what is the next thing I should, I should be looking at? And those are all, that should all be articulating your business's goals, your goals for the user in that moment. Yeah. Really. And that is, uh, that is definitely, yeah, that's, that's one of the, the big ones right there. Yeah. Is, so don't is have fun anxiety. Yeah. Look yeah. at that composition and, and, and say, does this clearly um, meet our objectives? Yeah, absolutely. Having design that, like we said before, um, is, is, is born out of the goals not designed for design's sake. Um, right. And I think that's a great thing that startups have kind of brought to the design community is it has to be uh, imminently functional. Like there's just not, there is no picture. There is no like, here's a photograph, don't you like it? It's like, no, like our design, it, it has to actually do something all day right. long, a million times a day. And so it just brings in all these new ways of looking at it and thinking about it that maybe have been there before, but they haven't been in the forefront like they are now. Yeah, yeah, you know, Baroque ornamentation of, of <laughs> leaves and, and flora and fauna are, 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 are out. Yeah, there's just no room for them anymore. They might have been there in the late 90s, but uh, 
But there's no room in the startup world yeah. for ordinary Yeah, the late 1890s, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let me ask you another question. What resources can you recommend to us? Obviously, your own book. Maybe hold it up one more time so we can see it there. So we there can make sure we all uh, go out and grab that off Amazon. Uh, I mean, honestly, I wrote it because the, it, it, you know, there because there weren't a ton of resources that that yeah really worked for folks. Absolutely. Are there any? Are there any blogs or you know uh, any other books or any people they should go and look at their designs or what they're doing? Um, where where could you send them to learn more beyond what we've talked about? Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of stuff cropping up. Um, Smashing magazine. I've I've written at least I've written at least one article f- for them before, and they that's have an addicting website right there. Great editorial process. They've got amazing content. Mm-hmm. Um, books. It, it it sort of depends on on uh, what you want to dig dig deeper into. I'm of course obsessed with typography. Mm-hmm. I think Robert Bringhurst's Elements of Typographic Style mm-hmm. is amazing. I um, I I willingly defer to to whatever he says in that book when it it uh-huh. comes to typography. Um, so th- those are a, a couple. Um, I, I think a lot of people uh, look around on Dribble a lot, mm-hmm. and they they learn some things that way. I think that uh, Pattern Tap is an interesting mm-hmm. website. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that has something. Where you could kind of say, "Oh, I want to see an interface for you know pagination," mm-hmm. you know, just show you a whole bunch of different ones from a bunch of different sites. Yeah, uh, little big details. I think it's a uh, Tumblelog or something. It, okay. It's not so not so much about visual design as it is um, thinking about little details mm-hmm. in in your user experience. Um, I think that's a, a, a resource that I enjoy as well. Yeah. Do you recommend that designers who are designing for startups go and look at the websites of other startups, knowing that, yeah, they have their own design decisions for their company goals, but going and really studying them and looking at them and kind of dissecting them more than just, hey, I went and signed up as a user and use it and I like it and it's beautiful, but really just looking at it for a while. Do you recommend that? Or do you think it makes yeah. some group think? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think I don't think that there's any 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 prop any harm in that. I think that uh, as long as you're doing it kind of the way that you just described, really, mm-hmm. you're you're like looking at the design and you're thinking from an abstract level. Yeah, there you go. You know what are they what are they trying to accomplish, and how is that manifesting itself in this design? Because chances are, hopefully, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish is in some way different from what it is that they're trying to. Accomplish, and um, so you're going to have to learn your own ways of, of of manifesting that through your through your design. So I think that's a great um, way to learn. Absolutely. All right. One last question: uh, What's the best advice that you can give to anyone that wants to design for a growing startup? Uh, let, let's say they're at a startup and they're wanting to design in such a way that it can grow. What's the best advice in a nutshell you could give them? No pressure. Uh, best, the, the best advice. Uh, the best advice I would would use is is uh, keep it simple with the stuff that you can see, mm-hmm. and think a, a lot about the stuff that you can't see. Um, right, to break that down, that, that's too uh, that's too uh, mystical. You gotta tell us more. What I know, that isn't means. it? I, I can I can go a little further. On. Like the 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 alignment of things, the white space, the. Uh, the sizing of elements, proportions, mm-hmm. uh, these things that people don't talk about enough. You know, you see people talking about fonts and effects and things, <laughs> things like that, because that's the stuff you can see. That's yeah. what's going to get. That's that's what's going to get noticed. Yeah. Um, and and if you really want to create that feeling of like, man, there's I don't know why this this design looks clean. Mm-hmm. Um, that's 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 where where it's going to come from. I, I actually have a specific story and somebody came up to me at a talk once and they 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 had their iPhone app and they're like David I I, I don't know why our app doesn't look good we look at here's our competitors app here's our app mm-hmm. we're like we kind of have the same basic things on our app but like ours just doesn't look good <laughs> it was cuz it was because of the things that he he couldn't see it was because of that, that alignment, the subtle things that you say mm-hmm. with a white space that's this big versus a white space that's that's this mm-hmm. big, um, 
those are the things uh, that are going to create that sense of, of cleanliness and that are going to create um, that, that customer trust yeah. that, that, that BJ Fogg demonstrated in, in, that, uh, in that study that when you look at something, you're like, oh, these guys know what they're doing. Yeah. No, I'm so glad you said that because I feel sometimes like I'm OCD because I'll be in Photoshop and I'll be moving a line of text to the left of pixel to the right of pixel to the left of pixel to the right of pixel because I got to get it exactly where it needs to be against yeah. whatever element it's next to. And the padding just has to be perfect or I just feel like it's horrible, you know? And if you yeah. do that with everything, you put that much time in it, you step back and you're like, all right, this will work. Like this, this makes me feel something like it's supposed to. That's really the thing that's so important, and that's the that 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 to me is the number one thing that that separates uh, uh, the, the 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 hacks from the hackers. I guess. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's good. Well, I think we can end on that. Don't be a hack. Be a hacker. Uh, learn how to design <laughs> from David Cadavi. Uh, thank you so much for being on the program. I think people are going to learn a ton from this, and they're going to realize that design and growth. Um, you know, there's a lot more to growth than just design, but it's hard to grow without it. Um, you know, right. Craigslist and the early Google, those are the exceptions that prove the rule. <laughs> Even Craigslist is stepping it up from a design. I mean, it's still pretty basic, but yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, but you look at today. most of the stuff that grows and it, it, it looks like it's supposed to. So, David, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks a lot for having me. It's been great.